Our text for this whole series has been John, the 10th chapter, verse 27. My sheep, this is Jesus speaking, hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. One of the things we've always encouraged you to, not to say is that I, the Lord never speaks to me, or I never, I never get a word from the Lord, and, and you don't want to say that. You, a better thing to say is, thank God I'm his sheep, and I hear his voice. And uh, that's, that's, just a, that's just a great way to, to say, Lord, I'm thanking you because this is what your word said and I believe you. So I'm thanking him before I ne necessarily see the fruition of that in my life. But last week we talked about a couple of things. I just want to clarify some things before we go. We talked about how do we hear from God? Well, the first one is the written word. And so we have the Bible, we have, we have the written word, which gives us a lot of great instructions in life. And then we talked last week about the, log the, the, the rhema. This is the written word. It's called the logos. The, the spoken word is called the rhema. And that's the quickened word. That's where you're reading. Have you ever been reading the Bible and just something just kind of jump out at you? And so that's a, that's a quickened word. Pay attention to that. Don't, don't ignore that. That's a, that's a quickened word. And I talked about how uh, last week we, we talked about how God can take verses that maybe don't even apply in context to, to how they were written, but how the Holy Spirit can take them and make them alive to you and, 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 bring, them, and bring them out to you. And uh, boy, what a blessing that is. I, uh, I also uh, I talked about how a minor surgery, I talked about how my mother had a word that helped sustain her and hold her when both of the kids went away. And so it's, it's important that God can not only speak through this word, but he can also quicken a word to you to make all the difference in the world. And, uh, and that's something that, uh, that, but that's a personal relationship. Amen. We have a personal relationship and the Lord knows how to talk to you and the Lord knows what you need. And so th th this is not surprising. This is just, yeah, that's, that's the Lord. He's good. He'll, he'll talk to you and, and, and he'll speak to you. And I hear people say, well, I, I never get a word. Let, let me help you with that. You need to be in the word to get a word. That's, it, it's, uh, I'm not trying to be uh, smart alley about this. I'm just saying that you, if you're not reading the Bible, don't expect to get a quickened word. Because you're, so often anybody would tell you, oftentimes it's just in reading and spending time with the Lord in reading that something would just come, come to you. And, uh, and so if you'll, you'll stay with it and read it, you're, you're going to get something out of it. Now, I'll, I'll, I want to give you a couple of guidelines. Day because I, you know, talk about a word, and you know, over the years, I've, I've just kind of, as a pastor, I've kind of watched people do things, and actually, I've done some. I'll, I'll talk about my dumb stuff, but um, you don't want to take a word God gave to someone else and act on it. Right, let me let me give you an example. Uh, when I was in Bible school, a guy came to our Bible school, and he was talking. He was a special speaker. He was talking, very dynamic speaker, and he was talking about the fact that he gave away his car. He had a car. And he gave his car away. And the Lord blessed him with a much better car. And I heard that and I went, that sounds like a good plan right there. <laughs> I didn't have enough faith to give my car away. Uh, and I also was married. But I, um, I, 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 did, I did have a watch that I didn't particularly like. <laughs> did you catch that? I didn't like it. And I gave it away. To a guy, I remember. I never forget when I gave it to him. He was, he was one of my fellow students. I gave it to him. I remember he looked at me and kind of went, "Thanks." <laughs> it, it did not bless him. Uh, and 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 guess what? The Lord gave me nothing. nothing. I looked at my hairy wrist for a long time. But here's the thing: I was acting on somebody else's word. You, you don't you want to do that. You can take, you can take a, a Bible promise that's a promise to everybody, and that can be yours. But oftentimes I'll hear people say, well, man, I heard so-and-so do this, and they got this word. I, I shared last week, if you were here last week, I talked about how my mother, uh, the Lord just quickened a word. It was a logos, uh, excuse me, a rhema word to her out of the book of, of Isaiah about her children returning and God pouring out his spirit on her seed. And I've, I've told that story, and, and last, the last, the last week was one of the only times someone has not come up to me and said, what was that scripture? And I know exactly what they're doing. You, you guys didn't do it, but oftentimes I've, I've told that, and people will come back and go, what was that scripture? And I know what they're doing. They're believing God for, for a loved one or believing God for children. 
And man, I understand that. If that that's, that's something that can be on your heart. But you can't take the word that God gave my mother, especially because it's, it's not a, a, a specific promise for that, and take that and apply it to you. Does that make sense? And I've seen people, I've seen people do this and then they get disappointed. So the key is, is, is you're asking the Lord, 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 help me. I, I'm, I'm believing for my children. I'm asking you for help for my children. And you, then you just, you stay open to whatever the Lord can speak to you. And I'm, trust me, he can do that. And so don't take someone else's word. Do not play Bible roulette. Now we're laughing, but sometimes we have to help people. So what do you mean Bible roulette? That's where you open the Bible and point to a verse and say, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? <laughs> That's my word for Bible roulette. Of course, you've heard the story about the guy who's like, man, I need to hear from the Lord. He played Bible roulette and his verse landed on and Judas went and hung himself. <laughs> he said, well, that can't be right. So he flipped a few more pages and put his thing in. And, that, and his next verse said, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> Don't do that. Do, do not play Bible roulette. You can come up with some weird stuff. Uh, and then uh, making decisions, stay open to Lord. When I, when I mean by that is if, if you're thinking, okay, I need to move, I need to move, I'm going to look up all the moving scriptures. No, you just want to stay open to the Lord. Lord, do you, do you want me to move? Uh, open means that I'm willing to hear a yes or a no. Um, do you want me to do this? I remember when we were praying about coming back to, um, to no, we were in North Carolina praying about coming back to Texas. And uh, Joy and I had gone up and we had a chance to spend a little bit of time in the mountains. And I, I was just reading, reading my Bible. And in, in Jeremiah, the 30th chapter, second part of verse 10 said, Jacob shall return and have rest and be quiet and no one shall make him afraid. I already had that in my heart that we were supposed to go back. And that verse was just quick. That, that verse was quick to me. And it was a confirmation. I wasn't looking up all the scriptures on return. Just you understand what I'm saying. So you, you want to stay open to what the Lord has. So that's that, that's part. I um, we've got night of worship next next week, which is going to be great, as always. So let, let me talk a little bit about uh, as we're talking about learning to hear from God. Let me talk a little bit about um, what I call inside information. In Acts chapter twenty-seven, Paul is on a ship. He was he was arrested by the Jews. They tried to kill him. Um, he, he was actually, he stayed in prison for a while. And finally, he appealed to Caesar. Paul was a Roman citizen. You could appeal to Caesar, much like appealing to our Supreme Court. And so they were sending him to Caesar. And they put him on a ship and they put him with a Roman centurion. And they came to an area, he was on the ship. He said, now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over. This was the time of the year and Paul and the centurion, everybody were on this ship. Paul advised them saying, men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman or the captain and the owner of the ship than by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also. If by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening toward the southwest and northwest and winter there. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. So you, you, you get the picture, Paul, they were traveling on a ship. That, that was how they uh, did a lot of long distance traveling in that time. They're on the ship and they, they stop at a place and it, it, it was past the time of the year that you're supposed to sail. It's a dangerous time, time of storms. And Paul said something interesting. He said, I perceive, I perceive. He said, this is gonna be bad. This is gonna end bad. So let's talk a little bit about that. 
because I want to talk a little bit about, and we're going to move away from just the word, uh, the rhema and the, and the logos. I'm going to talk about how the Lord can lead us on the inside. He said, I perceive. To perceive means to become, excuse me, aware, become aware of through the senses or to become conscious of. Paul had a perception. He did not say, God told me. By the way, I think that was real wisdom. Paul's sailing with a bunch of unbelievers. And if he just stood up and said, God told me, they're going to be looking at him like, what? Seriously? Um, he said, I perceive. In other words, I, I become aware of something. What was he aware of? He was aware that trouble was up ahead. And so he was aware of that. Th that's not a, a natural. He, did, he said, well, Paul got a vibe. No, I, I don't think it's a vibe. Paul was, Paul was alerted to something and the Holy Spirit, the, remember Jesus said that when the Holy Spirit would come, he would show you things to come. His ability, and so he's, he's, he's witnessing to Paul, this is going to be bad. We could all die here. And so he uses the word, I perceive. Now, when he said that, others didn't get it. He said, I perceive. He said, I'm picking this up. No one else was. And the centurion didn't listen to Paul. He listened to the experts. Experts said, no, no, we really, we need to get out of here. This is not a good place to, to harbor. We need to go. And, uh, and then when the majority was in, was in agreement with that, and then when a soft wind blew softly, everyone's thinking, okay, this looks really good. Uh, we need to leave. Soft wind's blowing softly. This is going to work out great. We're going. And they took off, set sail, and hit a major storm. I mean, they were in this storm for two weeks. And they were just, it just, it was horrible. They threw, they threw all the food overboard. They threw the tackling of the ship overboard. They threw everything but the people overboard, trying to simply stay alive and, and, and ride out this storm. And uh, Paul's thinking, man, we're going to die. And fortunately, an angel showed up and said, Paul, your prayers are heard, and God's granted you everybody on this ship. There's about 250 people on the ship. And God saved all 250 people because Paul needed to get to Rome. Aren't you glad that there are people who are on your ship that God has had mercy on because you're the ones that, that have got to go somewhere? And so he, but, but the perception is what, is what Paul said, I, I perceive. So let's talk about what, what, what is that perception? It's really how the Lord communicates with us. Proverbs, the chap, 20th chapter, verse 27 says this. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner depths of his heart. The spirit of man. It's in, it's in our spirit that the Lord enlightens us. Not our mind, not our body, it's, it, it's in our spirit. Many of you have heard me tell the, the, the story of how the Lord enlightened joy years ago when we were, um, this is before we started the church, on a Christmas Eve service. She turned and lit her stepfather's candle at, at the service. We were at another church and she lit the candle. And as soon as she did, a scripture came up in her heart. Precious in the Lord is the death of one of his saints. And at that time, we didn't know anything about her stepfather's situation. And at that time, he was not a believer. And, but the, but the, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And in effect, the Lord just lit her candle. And she came back, she said, Alan, she said, as soon as I lit his candle, the Lord pretty much lit my candle. He said, precious in the Lord, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. That's a, song, that's a verse out of the Psalms. And when she said that, we didn't really know what was going on except a few weeks later, they came and told us that her father had stage four cancer. And he was going downhill pretty rapidly. But precious in, in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. Well, by the way, if you're a believer, do you know what the Bible, you're referred, Bible refers to you as a saint? That might be news to you. Don't Just look straight ahead. Don't look at your neighbor with, with, with unbelief. Just look straight ahead and go, you? Yeah, yeah. You, you can be a saint. You're a saint. The Bible calls us that. And so... Right, just a few weeks before he died, I'll never forget, his name was Dale, great guy. Joy was actually sick. 
he was staying with us for a little bit and laying on the couch. And uh, Joyce said, with, with three little ones, all of a sudden it just became quiet. She looked at him. She said, Dad, you, you need to pray. We need to pray about, about receiving the Lord. He said, you pray for me, Joy. He always said that. You pray for me, Joy. And uh, she smiled. She said, no, you need to pray. He said, okay, just this once. That's all we need. <laughs> and, and she led him in the prayer that, uh, very similar to what we pray here. And uh, he, he was gone just a few weeks later. But Catholic background, the priest said when he came by, he said, never seen a man so at peace to go home. Precious, precious in the sight of the Lord. It's the death of one of his saints. But he realized how the Holy Spirit lit joy and she knew. And it gave her something to go on. And it gave her some strength. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And this is where he, he enlightens us. He said, well, that's, that's wonderful. That's joy. She's the pastor's wife. She wasn't then. She was a stay-at-home mom. And so this is not a function of, um, it, it's not a function of God speaks to some people and some people it doesn't. It really is the function of we need to become more conscious of the fact that we're a spirit. In, when Paul was writing to the church of Thess Thessalonians, Thessalonica, he said this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify or separate you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's very interesting that he would list it that way, spirit, soul, and body. And I, I think we need to understand some things here. One, that uh, we're more than just a brain and a body. Now if you listen to people talk and, uh, who come outside of Christian circles, we're just talking about a secular world, have you ever noticed it's we're a brain and a body? And the brain, everyone talks about the brain. They're just really amazed with the brain. Yeah, our brain is amazing. But you're more than just a brain and a body. You're a spirit. You have a soul and you live in the body. That's a, that makes us a, a, a three-part individual. Spirit, soul, and body. Spirit is, is, is the eternal part of us. And that's also where we contact the spiritual realm. But that's the spirit side of us. If you've ever been to a funeral and, and you look at someone in a, in, in a casket, you recognize they're not there. How many times have you heard people say that? Oh, that's not them. They're not there. And they're not there. Their, their spirit has gone on. Spirit, their soul. The soul is the mind and the will and the emotions. And that's the, um, that's the mental part and the emotional part. Very connected to our spirit. I heard a, a pastor say one time, and uh, he's talked about, he said, we don't even recognize the impact of how receiving the Lord, receiving the life of God on the inside of our spirit, how that can impact our mind and our emotions. And he, he actually listed a, a couple of people who had just amazing transformation that their intelligence went up after becoming a Christian. And, and his, his comment was, the life of God impacting our spirit can impact our entire body. And we know that. You're stronger in your spirit, it impacts the rest of us. And so, I, you know, I thought, man, that's a good thing. But as soon as I heard him say that, I thought, man, that's good. I can believe that. The life of God hits me. I am smarter than I used to be. Amen. Now, I, I bet some of you can probably say the very same thing. I am smarter and I think clearer than I used to think after I came to the Lord. Well, some of that drugging and partying that you did, you stopped that. So that probably helped you clear up a little bit. <laughs> but, but the idea is that life of God hits our spirit. It can make all the difference in the world. So... We're spirit, we have a soul, we live in the body. That's the easiest part of us to connect with. We know about the body, that's the physical realm. So, what do we talk about when we talk about I perceive? The Holy Spirit witnesses to our spirit. This is Romans 8, 16. This is, this is a, a great verse. The spirit himself, not itself, himself, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. How many of you, after you made Jesus your Lord, you could just say, if someone said, are you saved? You might have been hesitant, but something on the inside of you told you you were. You're just like, yep, yeah, no, I am. There's something that, that bears witness with us on the inside, that we're a child of God. And what the enemy loves to do is love to, he loves to attack people who are young believers. And if they sin or mess up, he'll tell them, well, if you really had gotten saved, you wouldn't have done that. 
No, that's not the truth. It's the fact that we still have a flesh and still have an unrenewed mind to deal with. And so even after you become saved, if you mess up, you don't have to get born again, again, and again. You just simply ask the Lord to forgive you. And he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. So the idea is we just get back in shape. But the idea is the Holy Spirit bears witness. Now that, that, that witness is not a, it's not, it's, it's, it's not a, um, a shout. It's a perception. Here's, here's something I think all of us can relate to. Have you ever had what you would call a hunch? You just had a hunch. Things were going to turn out. Ah, I just had a hunch. I used to call it a, a hunch until I came over and began to realize, no, that's, that's really, I'm, I'm picking up spiritually what the Holy Spirit is saying to me. And that's a witness. Not a voice, not a shout. And I encourage you guys, don't be asking for voices. <laughs> you, you, don't, you, you, you don't want voices. Um, people have asked me, have you ever heard the audible voice of God? No, I have not. And here's another thing. I'm not asking to. I've got the Holy Spirit living on the inside of me and he can lead me and guide me. And, and the key is learning to be led not by a shout or, or a loud voice or a sign. We're big on that. Lord, show me a sign. You want me to marry them? Have four white cars go past my house. <laughs> Do not pray that way. That's not a good way. We're not, looking, we're not looking for something on the outside. Well, here's the thing. We say, well, if, Alan, if, if God is bearing witness with my spirit, how come I'm not picking it up? Ha, huh, that's, that's an accurate phrase. We're not picking it up because often we're too busy. And not just busy doing something. I've talked, we're either busy with our bodies or busy with our minds. And our minds are busy. How many of you have ever had a brilliant epiphany in the shower? Anybody? You know, all of a sudden, you, you had a revelation. Something came. Do you know why, what, what happens in the shower? Our mind just finally goes blank for a little bit. And we're just in the shower. And all of a sudden, we, we pick up what's on the inside of us. See, the idea is the more conscious we become of the fact that we are a spirit, we have a soul, we live in a body, that we can become conscious of the fact that our spirit is where the Lord enlightens us. And we get witnesses. Listen, that's how this church started. This church did not start with an angel with a flaming scroll going, thou shalt go to Conroe. <laughs> we were, were praying about it. And I remember crossing I-45 and crossing over the loop and Conroe just, the Lord, the Lord, let me, let me show you another Psalm. You'll like this one. Psalms 18, 28. For you, Lord, will light my lamp. The Lord, my God, will enlighten my darkness. And that is such a, that is such a, a, a just an accurate phrase. That sometimes you're just going along and all of a sudden, you, you're, my lamp got lit with Conroe. I'm crossing the road and I, I, I went, Conroe? Where, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't even thinking about Conroe. I wasn't even praying about Conroe. Conroe dropped in my heart. And so I remember going home and telling Joy. I said, I don't know where we're supposed to start our church. She said, where? I said, Conroe. I remember she looked at me and she went, Conroe? You do realize there was a time when Conroe was not the fast, one of the fastest growing cities in America. You do realize that Conroe at one time was a sleepy little town north of Houston. In fact, when I told Pastor Osteen I was starting a church in Conroe, he went, where's Conroe? I went, thank God. It is so far north of you, Pastor. But that was, that was that's how it, it, started with, it started with simply the Holy Spirit bearing witness with me that this is where it was. I just had a perception. And I tried to go away. I, I tried to, do, to go into other areas. I drove toward Tomball. And every time I got toward, I, every time I got in another area, I just had a, on the inside. I, this is not it. But when I kept thinking about Conroe, I had a, a, a good perception on the inside. It, it, here's, the, here's, the, here's the challenge, guys. This is not an exact science. And so as you're learning to be led by the Lord, uh, I'm, I'm going to promise you, you will make mistakes. But the idea is just don't not worry about it and say, Lord, thank you that you can lead me. And if you witness to me that I'm a child of God, then you can witness to me about other things as well. Amen. And Romans 8, 14 said, for those who are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. 
So the Holy Spirit actually has the ability to lead us, and we just need to be able to, to pick it up and become sensitive as to his leading. And, and here, I, 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 in fact, I was thinking about it today. So I'm getting, I'm getting ready to, uh, Wednesday's a study day for me. And so I, I'm studying and I'm, I'm having some lunch. And I'm about to go and, and, and get something to read. And I realize it is so challenging for us to not fill up every moment that we have. Am, am I the only one here? Have you ever noticed it's challenging just to be quiet? It's challenging just to, you're sitting there waiting in line. Have you ever seen people wait in line? Everyone's doing this, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I, and I'm guilty, I've done it. And I'm, sitting, I'm getting ready to have lunch. I, I'm thinking about the message, but now all of a sudden I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna think about reading the news or the Wall Street Journal or something. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go that direction. And, I, and it just, I, I, I got caught up. I said, Lord, I'm doing the very same thing I tell people not to do. It's, it's, it's get so busy in my mind that even if you're trying to witness to my heart, a lot of times I don't pick it up. So the key is, this is why, this is why, quiet time, you people, you hear people talk about quiet time, so valuable. Learning to be quiet, learning to get our minds at rest, learning to, to slow our bodies down, and just get quiet before the Lord and pray. If you pray in the Spirit, that's probably one of the best ways to get quiet. It's a, a huge advantage. But it's, a, it's, it's the idea of getting quiet. Why? So I can sense what is the Lord witnessing to my heart. And here's the beautiful thing is, he wants to witness to you. He is. We just need to get tuned in to hear what he's saying. Amen. Did you hear what I just said? Amen. He's talking. We need to tune in. He, he's witnessing. A lot of times, if you're not careful, you'll take this thought. Well, the Lord doesn't talk to me. He talks to Alan. Alan's a pastor. He talks to so-and-so. They're spiritual. Uh, I'm, I'm nothing. Well, one, that's wrong. If, if you, you are not nothing. God paid an awesome price for you. you. You are extremely valuable. And he loves you every bit as much as he loves me. And he loves you every bit as much as he loves joy. And he loves, yes. <laughs> but you leave me on that one? Yes. He loves you every bit as much as he loves Joy or Justin or Mary Beth or anyone that you think, wow, they're, they're amazing. Listen, let's get out of that they're amazing. Jesus is amazing. God is amazing. And the rest of us are supporting cast. And we're all in the, and listen, when it comes to God talking to us, to he leading us, God loving us, we're all in the same boat. Different functions, different jobs, same love. He loves you just as much as he loves your most famous preacher in America. He loves you just as much. And he will talk to you. And if you just open up your heart and begin to say, Lord, thank you that you love me. I am your sheep and I hear your voice. Thank you for that. If you begin to thank him ahead of time, you'll begin, oh, you'll begin to pick it up. And that's, that's a beautiful man. And. And practice this. Just practice having a few moments of your day quiet. No screen, no noise, just quiet. And, uh, and see what it does for you. It's a good discipline, but it's how we tune in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your, your willingness to lead us, to guide us, to talk to us. Thank you that the Holy Spirit's role in our life is a helper and he is helping us. We are your sheep and we hear your voice and we thank you for that. Thank you that you're talking and thank you that we can hear. So Father, thank you tonight for every individual that's here and I ask for your blessings on their life. If you're here this evening and you say, you know what, Alan, I don't, I don't even have a relationship with the Lord or if I do, I don't know it. Or maybe you're like I was and you had a relationship and you've gotten far away from God and you're like, I don't want to be there. I, I, want, I want to be close to the Lord. I, I want his influence in my life. I, I want his voice in my life. Said your bow and eyes are closed. If that's you, I'm not going to have you stand up or come to the front, but we're going to pray. If that's you that I'm talking to. And you say, you know what? I, I want to connect with the Lord. Or I want to reconnect with him. Would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up just real quick? Cross out to him. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Appreciate your courage. Put your hands down. We're going to pray. 
If you didn't lift your hand and you really wanted to, that's the cry of your heart. Pray this prayer with us. If you're online, you can pray it with us as well. We're going to pray it out loud. Say, Dear God, I know mankind needs a Savior. I know I can't save myself. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And God raised you from the dead. Right now, I confess you as my Lord, as my Savior, as the one who forgives me and restores me. Thank you, Jesus. My past is forgiven. I have a relationship with you. I'm a new creation in Christ because I've said yes to you. I had still bowed, eyes closed. Father, thank you for those who prayed that prayer. For those who've come out of darkness into light and for those who've come back home. And Lord, we, we rejoice with them. And we rejoice in what you're doing in us to will and do of your good pleasure. Thank you, Father. You're, you've never given up on us. You never will. And we don't give up on you. I give you all the praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Listen, if you prayed that with us, if, you, if you're online, that you can, you can scan that. If you're here, you can scan it. And we'll get, your, we'll get your information. We'll pray for you. There's a card right by your feet. And don't forget that. Hey, and if you are a widow or a single mom, we've got a gift for you in the lobby. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. We love you. We're praying for you. Have a great week, guys. Thank you.